You won't find a lot of basements in LA. I have one and I use it to grow mushrooms. It's kind of a tight hallway, so um, we'll, we'll do our best to all fit down there. But it's gonna be kind of a tight squeeze. I grow a lot of different varieties here, not just for the farmer's market. I'm Athena Brunsberger. Welcome to Suppress Science. The fundamental question for this episode is easy to ask, but complicated to answer. Why are governments and individuals around the world so afraid of a class of substances that are neither habit-forming nor deadly, and have been used safely for thousands of years? The answer traces back to the 1960s social movements, and even the Cold War. It also involves the pharmaceutical industry, the medical establishment, and our ever-evolving understanding of neuroscience. But at its heart, it's about what these substances very often represent. Freedom, cognitive expansion, experimentation, as well as the destabilization of several major industries. Today, we're looking into the suppressed science of psychedelics. There are several different classes of naturally occurring psychedelics. Psilocybin from mushrooms, mescaline from cactus, DMT from the Amazon, the Hawaiian root kava, the Egyptian blue water lily, to just name a few. These molecules have been used throughout the ages and around the world as recreation and as sacraments. With origins that date back to prehistory and controversies that span centuries, the current shift in FDA status is just the latest milestone. But with the mainstream academic research reinvigorated and large-scale medical studies yielding promising data, the next chapter in the story of psychedelics is being written right now. Humans have been taking psychedelics since there were humans. Since humans were eating plants, humans have been getting high on plants. <laughs> How do we know this? Well, it's well documented in, um, in anthropology that in a lot of ancient cultures, this was a really regular thing, part of spiritual rituals and also just connectiveness in communities that taking psychedelics was fairly regular and widespread in uh, many different ancient civilizations. I wrote a lot about uh, Eastern mysticism, you know, gurus, cults, sects, new religious movements. And, and I, I stumbled across a lot of people over the years, you know, who got in, interested in meditation, mindfulness, Buddhism, Hinduism, and I'd ask them how they got interested in this. And a lot of people would say, well, it all started with that acid trip, you know, back in 1966. I'm gonna go back a little bit to uh, a chemist named Albert Hoffman, mm -hmm. who was a, a chemist with Sandoz Laboratories in Switzerland. And uh, in the late 30s and in, into the early 1940s, he was doing work uh, lo looking for compounds to treat other conditions and things. And he stumbled across this drug called LSD-25. And it really wasn't until 1943, that in the middle of World War II, that he discovered the powerful psychoactive effect that this drug had. And it was, it was hundred, hundreds of times more powerful than other known psychedelics at the time. Psychedelic research really took off in the 1950s and 1960s, particularly in the US and the UK. It was really a promising field. However, a lot of the experiments that were run weren't the most ethical. And this was also before the sort of field of bioethics existed. Well, Timothy Leary is probably the, the best known and the most infamous. He was a rising star, a psychologist. He was he wrote a book on personality assessment. Um, so he was hired, he had a temporary assignment at Harvard. And in the summer of 1960, during his summer break, he was down in Mexico and he took psilocybin mushrooms with uh, some friends and some other uh, academics who were just hanging out down there for the summer. And he had what he later recalled the most uh, powerful religious experience of his life and became convinced that psychedelic drugs were not only going to revolutionize psychology, psychiatry, they were going to change the world. And so he basically came back to Harvard in the fall of 1960 and started the Harvard Psilocybin Project. And before it could develop and the experiments could be run well and rigorously and ethically, uh, psychedelics was basically shut down. But very quickly, what began as a scientific research project kind of spun out of control and really became a social crusade to turn on America to psychedelics. In some ways, I think Leary and Alpert gave up on science rather than science kind of giving up on them. 
they really saw this as a kind of a bigger project. And there were also some abuses in, in a way that they had agreed to not give uh, psychedelics to undergraduates, to only to graduate students, and they violated that agreement. And in some ways, it was a research project. In some ways, it was a big party. <laughs> it, yeah. got a little, it got a little wild. Right after World War II, uh, U.S. intelligence agencies, including the, C the CIA, which was just forming out of something called the OSS during World War II, and Army intelligence, various U American intelligence agencies started looking at this drug as a potential chemical weapon that could be maybe sprayed on enemy troops <laughs> as a kind of a weapon of mass distraction <laughs> rather than destruction. <laughs> um, or it could be used as like a truth serum, you know, to interrogate prisoners or uh, as mind control, you know. Uh, so all these fairly bizarre uh, army and CII uh, experiments began in the, really in the, in the late 40s, early 50s, kind of before MKUltra, but it was the same kind of idea. Yeah, so MKUltra, um, the government from 1953 to 1973 did something like 150 experiments on people, um, not always with their their understanding or permission where they would use LSD to try to experiment with mind control or with torture you know, for possible use in defense or intelligence operations. Some of the most kind of abusive and nefarious research in this was really sponsored by our government, but it was all secret, right? And a lot of times, uh, even some of the pure science, kind of the, the, the research into this was secretly funded by the CIA through front groups. So there may be a, there might have been a, a, a neuroscientist or a, a, a psychologist who was doing research with psychedelics and didn't even realize that it was being funded by the CIA, you know, through a front group. I mean, there were some bizarre things they did. The, the craziest one was in San Francisco, actually. They set up a brothel mm -hmm. and they were giving LSD to the customers, the Johns and secretly filming them to see what effect LSD would have on them. Of course, unwittingly, wow. you know, these guys didn't know that they were being, you know, dosed, uh, you know, so that of course violates <laughs> any kind of ethical standards. One of the first big stories I did actually as a young journalist in San Francisco was about a, an army intelligence experiment called uh, Operation Third Chance. They gave LSD to a uh, a soldier who had false, was falsely accused of being a spy and basically interrogated him for three months in a hostile environment, almost torturing him while he was on LSD. Of course, he didn't know what he was getting. Right. Uh, and this came out, so stories like this started coming out in the 70s. The other thing to understand about the MK Ultra and all that, what kind of started it was, there were reports that this, it was in the middle of the Cold War, right? Again, with the Soviet Union. And there's all the crazy hysteria around, you know, communism and the Cold War, you know, which I, I, I grew up as a you know, kid experiencing that. And there are reports that the Soviet Union had purchased 50 million doses of LSD from Sandoz. So a lot of it was the, the military worrying about what the Russians were doing. You know, it was sort of like the, the nuclear arms race, except it was a chemical kind of arms race or a psychedelic arms race that was going on. But it was really later in the 60s that psychedelics kind of, you know, escaped from the laboratory, you know, and into the street and the genie was kind of out of the bottle. In the mid 20th century, where there was a lot of anti-establishment, anti-social, anti-war movements, there was also within those movements a lot of use of psychedelics. And while one does not have anything to really do with the other, they became entangled. And governments used psychedelics to target people involved in protest movements. Um, and they created a narrative around it being dangerous, creating antisocial behavior, creating criminal behavior, um, where counterculture movements were really, you know, out of line, out of sync with the status quo. And governments and the powers that be really used psychedelic use as an explanation for this and made it scary. Psychedelics were banned by many governments around the world. It was impossible to get them. It was dangerous to use them for fear of you know, being incarcerated. Um, and they were designated as a Schedule I narcotic. But I think people fear them because you kind of 
you often lose control, and that is part of how they work. They work by disrupting your normal modes of thought. Sort of, they can break you out of a rut. So the lack of control is, is sort of an inherent part of their therapeutic mechanism, and that's scary.、Uh, it's both scary for the person who is going through the experience, who is using the medicine, and also people who are the therapists and doctors who are prescribing it, and also for society because you don't know what's going to happen to these people. You might fear that they will they will have a bad trip and they will never come back. The basic model for using psychedelics as part of modern clinical practice to treat PTSD and anxiety is fundamentally different from how current treatments employ things like antidepressants. Rather than an inhibitory drug taken daily that acts by blocking neurotransmitters, the psychedelic approach is actually about stimulating heightened levels of activity to create lasting change throughout experience. If ingrained psychological patterns are like paths carved into snow by sleds on a hill, forcing all future sleds to follow them. The psychedelic effect might be described as a neurological equivalent of a fresh snowfall, which covers the paths carved by old habits and allows for new patterns to emerge. I have to, you know, full disclosure. I, I grew up in the '60s, so my first <laughs> in- introduction to psychedelics was,、uh, you know, reading about them in Life magazine or, you know, hearing hearing about them on the news, or often hearing the lurid accounts that were propagated. In the early '70s,、uh, I was out of college. I had a position as a research assistant in a dream research laboratory in New York. My job was to stay up all night monitoring EEGs and waking people up after they had gone through a dream, tape recording the dream. But to、wow. stay up all night, I needed good material to read. And it turned out that one of the investigators had in his office a collection, I think, of pretty much everything that had been published to date on the topic of psychedelics. And I just devoured this material. I found it absolutely fascinating. By the time I got out of medical school, all psychedelic research in the country had been shut down. The human psyche is complex, so there's no clear mapping between a particular molecule and a particular outcome. And even if a psychedelic only works on a particular neurotransmitter, that can cause a lot of changes in someone. Most of the what we think we know about the binding and the neurochemistry comes from in vitro studies, right? So chemists will take these drugs, they will see what they bind to in a dish, but but we don't really know what happens in vivo. The brain is actually incredibly connected to many many things when we're born. And through behavior and through,、um, you know, culturation, we actually learn to filter out things. And so we're actually much more aware when we're we're children and we're babies. And so it's thought that then psychedelics actually break down those filters that we learn, and which would actually go along much more with the experience of taking psychedelics. So that's the way I like to think of them. And we don't, you know, know so much how the neuroscience、um, explains that. My name is Will Sue. I am a psychiatrist. I guess that's technically my profession, even though I, I think of myself as, as wearing many different hats these days. I feel like science is less teaching us, and it's catching up with the experiences that we have, and so it always lags behind. The major medication classes are antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, and antipsychotics. And I remember thinking about this early on, where all of those were basically saying. If you feel something, if you feel anxiety, which is the clinical word for fear, if you feel depression,、um, which is the clinical word for sadness, we also take things、um, in our everyday life like alcohol that that will also suppress.、Um, or I think we do things like behaviors, like with cell phones and, and social media, that suppress, suppress, suppress. Where I think of psychedelics as being evocative, right? They, they bring things to the surface that might be uncomfortable, that might be painful. Um, memories that we may have forgotten about. So I think of them as evocative instead of suppressive. That's what makes the difference with、um, why we're seeing them have an impact on mental health. It's because it's, we're not hiding from the things that have caused us pain that need to be processed. We're actually dealing with them. I think a lot of people are questioning whether traditional antidepressants are really working that well. This new model of drug therapy, where it's really more about the the drug as a catalyst. Rather than a pill you take every day, that's kind of a new model, a new way of looking at drug therapy. Pharmaceutical products are often administered for days, for weeks, for months, for years. 
for the duration of someone's life. The psychedelic treatment model may involve the administration of a psychedelic, possibly on only one occasion. I, I do really love what's happening right now. You've got the academic community learning and catching up by reading books, by reading media, learning about it from outside of academia. There's a switch right now. Decades of stigma and suppression of research pertaining to psychedelic substances has actually resulted in a general lack of institutional knowledge about not just psychedelics, but even the study of mushrooms or mycology in general. For a first-hand look at a citizen scientist doing cutting-edge research initially inspired by his unique artistic creations, I headed to the hybrid art studio and science lab of Samuel Schumacher. The mushrooms here are not hallucinogenic, but the impact both culturally and scientifically of psychedelic research has guided much of Sam's work. A community of people is learning how to grow mushrooms in their garage, and they're trying to replicate the procedures and big university science programs that are able to grow these mushrooms under very controlled conditions with fancy equipment. And then and suddenly, the, the people with a lot of money are starting to replicate the things that are developed in people's garages. I am excited to see mushrooms go mainstream. It's maybe for some people like your favorite band becoming popular and you're like, I knew about them first. This is a uh, myco material. The idea here is that um, a sawdust substrate has been inoculated with mushroom mycelium. Mushrooms can eat cigarette butts, concrete, all sorts of things that you wouldn't think could be converted into food. Um, so in this case, I gave oak sawdust to this Phomatopsis mushroom. So this is a prototype for something that I want to mimic foam um, as an alternative to plastic and petroleum products. We don't fully know the potential of these mushrooms. And so it's great to see institutional funding. It's great to see businesses emerge that are making mycomaterials, that are producing these um, medicines using mushrooms. But I, I think we still have a lot to learn. You won't find a lot of basements in LA. Um, I have one and I use it to grow mushrooms. It's kind of a tight hallway, so um, we'll, we'll do our best to all fit down there. I keep blocks of mushrooms on the shelf. So this is a um, lion's mane mushroom. And so the mushroom lives in this bag for a few weeks and then um, once it has captured all these available nutrients, it's strong enough to be brought into my fruiting room. So I have selectively isolated and cloned varieties that have desirable characteristics. So I keep a, a library of cultures. I have about two dozen at this point. I hydrate them, I supplement them with soy holes, bran, and gypsum. The next stage would be a grain spawn. These grains are, are slowly being colonized by the hyphal threads of the mycelium. Um, most of my work is done downwind from this HEPA flow hood. So when I'm working with sensitive cultures and agar that I don't want to be contaminated, I come down here, I keep a positive pressure system here, like a hospital that's gonna be moving fresh air through this room and not sucking in dirty air. This is the, the cleanest, part of the production. I grow a lot of different varieties here, not just for the farmer's market, but also for uh, my art and just my research. I'm growing some poisonous mushrooms right here that I would never bring to the market. I'm farming things, but I'm also growing sculptures. This mushroom needs a little bit more care um, than the bags um, in open, open air can provide. Uh, I need a kind of higher concentration of CO2, so I keep it in this little mushroom condo. The uniquely trippy art that Sam creates and the science that he's had to learn to grow such magnificent mushrooms is a perfect example of the largely undiscussed relationship that exists between traditional scientific researchers and the underground community that has been developing knowledge about exotic fungi and psychedelics during the decades that they've been outlawed. So there's a bit of a feedback loop between the drug culture and the people that are studying in universities. So I have friends that are working on their PhDs, and they're actually using procedures and technology that was developed by people within the sort of psychedelic counterculture drug community. With more and more traditional research into the therapeutic use of psychedelics being approved with each passing year, we have to ask ourselves, what's the danger in all of this?
And is there a specific group which potentially stands to lose if psychedelics turn out to be as revolutionary as an option as some proponents believe they are? It is very threatening to farm to big pharma. Yeah, because, you know, they make a lot of money on antidepressants. You know, right. like a pill you have to take every day is a much better business model mm -hmm. <laughs> for a pharmaceutical company than a drug that you take once or twice, and that's it. We've spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on pain medications, depression medications, and anxiety medications, and ADHD attention medications, and if all of that research actually could just be supplanted with like a mushroom. That really doesn't bode well for an industry that employs thousands of people and is worth billions of dollars. The challenge ahead of researchers right now is to try to create experiments that test the safety and efficacy of dosing for psychedelics to treat various disorders. To do that though, they might be breaking the law unless psychedelics are decriminalized. They also might be putting patients at risk. From a harm reduction standpoint, can we really help people with their quality of life? Can we reduce the harms that they experience from mental illness? And don't we have an obligation to do that? FDA actually first gave breakthrough therapy designation to MDMA. And then it was at least a few months later, or if not a year later, that it did the same for psilocybin. And it's a very big deal. Two things that not too long before were thought of as dangerous and addictive. Then the FDA all of a sudden is saying, oh no, they're not dangerous and addictive, they're actually really important and we've got to put them through this process was um, a really big deal for science. So I'm a little concerned that this field has gone from being shut down altogether for some 25 years to opening up very cautiously, very slowly, and now it's suddenly opening wide up very quickly, almost very precipitously. A lot of new players are coming into the field, and I think it just interjects an element of the unknown. The future is really a, a question mark right now. The pharmaceutical industry has created this pyramid of treatments for, you know, you get a pill for one thing, but that causes a bunch of other symptoms that you need to take pills for, and like, it costs a lot of money. It's very expensive. People don't like it, uh, and it's bad in a lot of ways. However, I guess the question is, do we really want those same companies that have created this inequitable system that is price gouging and not doing research on side effects and trying to undermine generics manufacturers, do we want those same companies to take over the manufacture of psychedelics? The reason that drugs are illegal is not because the drugs are dangerous, it's the type of people that are taking them. Prohibition with alcohol was like Irish and Italian immigrants. In the 30s, there was the Marijuana Tax Act when they first went after marijuana. You know, African-Americans and jazz musicians were, you know, smoking this. And, and then in the 60s, it was hippies and the counterculture were going after psychedelics. It's because of the people taking the drug and it's a means of social control. This quote is actually by John Ehrlichman, who was the White House chief domestic advisor to Richard Nixon. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know that we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. More individuals having a psychedelic experience is going to be an interesting social experiment. You have all this energy, all this interest for good reasons because people are really suffering right now, but the availability of the treatments and the skill set needed to work with these tools is far lagging behind right now. Rick Doblin, who is the founder of MAPS, and again, he is the singular figure that is responsible for where things are today. So he, he actually put out a quote recently that he said something like, I hope by 2050 that society knows and learns how to use psychedelics. Meaning there's all this energy and investment and all, and he's like, he knows enough to know, like it's, it's going to be a while, decades before we really um, know how to harness the power of these medicines.